Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being there on a Saturday morning. Uh, don't be afraid of the title. It can be summarized by like crappy Android AppSec. But let's go into more details. A few words about me. Uh, I'm a developer, uh, not a pen tester. Uh, spent last 10 years uh, between Lausanne and Geneva building and coding for security solutions. Uh, and I started yeah, to get focused on mobile uh, beginning of 2010. It was a time when you started to have like decent CPU power to start to do real cryptography and have nice APIs and SDKs to, do, to start to do some real stuff for mobile. Uh, now I'm freelance at my own company. Basically, I help people writing secure code. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter. The name is Securing Apps. Uh, tweets are in my own opinions and also the opinions of my company because I'm alone. So that's convenient. I can say what I want. <laughs> Even if it's recorded. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, small introduction on why native and, uh, well, most of the time we've been discussing about web security and all that stuff, but at one point, you want a mobile app because it's trendy, because the business asks for it. And uh, most of the time now, if you want a mobile app, you decide to go native because it's better for usability, uh, it's more reactive. Uh, performance wise, if you need to do crypto and all that stuff, it's also far better. And you can handle all the connectivity issues because there are still lots of places where your 3G connection is really bad. So you can uh, handle all those uh, offline use cases. Uh, but then this has some implications. When you have an existing web solution, you somehow need to adapt it, to extend it, to be able to handle uh, those uh, mobile native cases. And what can happen is what was all coded and stayed in the server, now somehow you have to move it in the mobile application. But this is really a big concern because as soon as you do that, all the code that was on the server and that was trusted cannot be trusted anymore in the mobile application because it's in the client side, so you can see anything if you want. Uh, so we'll see an example of what can go bad if you don't handle that well. What I want to show there is that it's not just a theoretical attack or whatever. People can Corporations can really lose money if they do a bad native app, even though their web solution was regularly pen tested and it was somehow okay. It was not that easy to steal some secrets or whatever on the web, but then because of the mobile app, it gets really, really easy. Uh, so I chose some app to do that, but keep in mind, what I will show, I hope you will find it funny, because you see there are really, really stupid mistakes made. But you can also think about mobile banking, Internet of Things for health applications, where you have your blood data or whatever that's uploaded. Or you can even think about, like two days ago, the French Ministry of Defense announced a new mobile app for terrorist attacks. So basically, you get notified if there is a terrorist attack or a nuclear plant accident. Just keep that in mind when you see the funny example and that it could happen for those big cases. Here, for the content of the speech, I don't want to mess with user data or whatever. That's why I put the white hat stuff. Uh, I warned the company like more than six months ago. They never answered. I sent them mails, official papers. I even had some contacts into this company. They give that to the big boss. They didn't do anything. Well, bad for them. Uh, so I chose a French magazine reading app. Uh, why? Well, I paid some magazine, and then there was some cool subscription when you had a paper copy, and you also had the electronic version for your tablet and whatever. And then like two months before the renewal, they made me some good deal. But there was a bug. So basically, I had several times the electronic version. But then at the end of my next subscription, I didn't receive anything. So I was really unhappy with that. And the help desk didn't care. So basically, I lost two months. So 
the bonus for, uh, for the renewal was lost. Uh, what I like for this topic is that it's not sensitive content. It's magazines that you can buy. So uh, I'm not disclosing anything precious that's linked to users. Uh, and what's also interesting is that they have set up some kind of DRM. But we'll see that it's total bullshit, in fact. <laughs> so, and then in bonus, we'll see that, uh, yeah, how we can be able to read those magazines even on uh, devices that are not supposed to be able to display them. So for me, it would be more convenient and could have like nice screens with iRes magazine and all that stuff. So how I'm going to do that? Uh, I don't like just to take one up and say, OK, I try to find whatever shit there is in it, and then I, I make a speech out of it. I really want to test two things. And You'll see from time to time, I will talk about the OWASP mobile top 10. This is version of this year. Uh, what I want to check, because for me, I know it's not going to take like two weeks. First, I want to check access control. So to check that, I will use Burp uh, and see how documents are handled. And I will use uh, these systems of magazines. So basically, you have the website where you can Subscribe for magazine, put your user info, put your credit card number, and decide to buy stuff. And then there is a mobile app. The mobile app, you type in just your login password, and you can only read magazines. So it's really read-only stuff. So what, what I will use, I will use my paying account, where I have those magazines in, uh, uh, already paid for that. And I will create another account, a free one which has access to no content, and I will check that if I can see magazines with a free account. So super easy to set up for the first step. Second step, I want to check the authentication of those mobile services. Again, you got the reference of the OWASP. And for me, if the access control is done well and the authentication is done well, you're going to have a hard time trying to find something significant. Well, for me, I'm a bit lazy. When I say that, I say, I won't find anything significant within two hours, so I will switch target. Uh, for that, for authentication, you will see, so we will start using Burp, and then we will do reverse engineering of the app, and you will see how it's super easy with Android stuff. And there is a good indicator for me already for the security of the solution. The Android app has not been updated for more than two years. So even if I, get, if I find something, I'm pretty sure they won't release a new version of the app meanwhile, and it will kill my attack. So access control. Use Burp. Uh, I connect with my paying account. I don't know the magazine. I gather all the stack trace for that. I see that while well, it's using post request with JSON. OK, standard stuff. First thing, no HTTPS. But sometimes there is a login password that's sent, and so it starts to, to smell bad. So for me, it's cool because I don't even have to do a man in the middle setting up a SSL certificate. And of course, they don't have certificate pinning. So for me, if I want to change the packet, it's going to be super easy. That's cool. But there's something more cool for me. I have a look at the backend, and what I see, they are running a PHP version, which is like five years old. And they're running Apache on Windows. <laughs> so kind of exotic mix. So I, I gather you get the best of two worlds, the bugs from Windows and the bugs from Apache. And, and you don't get any updates, of course, because this is like cross-compilation, and it's a, it's a big mess. So this Apache version, yeah, five years old. So I won't turn to meta exploit on that, but I guess you get hundreds of pages. <laughs> of possible attack. So for me, that's good, because I really now have more confidence that I can dig a, li a little into the, this application, and I will find really stuff. Sequence diagram, detail for those who would like to download the slide after. Basically, you have what they call a DRM backend and a document backend. One is going to do the security, and one is going to deliver the document. Uh, what there is is, the mobile sends a request and just give an host token. And then the security backend gives a list of documents. You ask for those documents with the host token. And then you get 
an encrypted document and you get a cryptographic uh, data to try to decrypt those documents. So there is some kind of DRM here, and really it's called DRM in the host name and whatever. So what I do, so I have this free account. First, at school, there is no email validation. So I can really just, uh, with a small Python script, create uh, 2,000 accounts within one second. If I want, it's going to work. So for me, it's easy. So I log in with my free account. Uh, and then I replay the uh, request you just saw before from my paying account, but inside I put the authentication token of the free account and I have a look what's going wrong. So all that took me less than 15 minutes to check. And here what we see, while well, they somehow they've done the work, uh, you can see some screenshots accessible. You have some metadata about the documents, but you can't get the document content, neither the DRM content. So it's somehow okay regarding OWASP M6. This is the only point that would, that would be okay. <laughs> but still, you can get a yeah, nice screenshot and see what's available. So now, I didn't find anything regarding access control, so I will switch to authentication. For that, let's reverse engineer the uh, Android app. First thing, if you don't have a device, well, you can download it from, like, all repos on the net. Uh, please don't run it on your own device. You never know from the Chinese website or whatever how they clone the Google Play Store or whatever. It's convenient because if you don't have the device with the correct display or the microphone or whatever, you can still uh, download any APK file you want, but you don't really know what's in it. So keep it to an emulator. Don't use it for yourself. Uh, then you have a super easy reverse engineering tool that basically you give your Android application, it, it gives you back the Java code within seconds. So with that, we are going to do uh, static analysis. We will review the code with some uh, IDE for that, dedicated to opening reverse code. And then later on, uh, we will have the bonus sections where with dynamic analysis, we will kill the DRM. So, and this step, like, less than five minutes, you download the IPK, you know, two command lines, and then you get like Java source code. Uh, first thing, that's cool, nothing is obfuscated. So you, you almost have the source code as it was done by the developers. So this is, again, an OWASP problem. You will see that they will cover almost anything from the OWASP top 10, which is a really good example. Uh, so. We, we saw before there was this uh, authentication token, so the only thing you have to do, I have to search for the host keyword. I find it there on the bottom, on the method, and I see also that this method is calling uh, an encrypt method. Okay, so for me it's okay. The authentication takes place, takes place here. So I have a look at the encrypt method. I know this gets really, really cool. Uh, so standard AES crypto, the, the EES mode is not that good, but still a detail. But have a look below for the keys. I don't know if you see much in the end, but it's so funny. So the key is called secret key. So the guys that coded that realized that it should be secret. But the key is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. And that's super cool because it's going to be all that for all the devices in the world will have this key which is super secret. But what does it mean? This is symmetric encryption. This means that the backend has this key also. And if they want to change the key on the backend, they have to republish the app and the other way around. And of course, regarding the initiation, initialization vector, well, just take the key the other way around. Huh? <laughs> Supposed to be random and always different per each usage, but why bother? So with that, well, I'm sure I can do something with it now. So that's what OWASP called politely insufficient cryptography. Uh, I would call it more stupid cryptography here, but I, I just don't know why they use symmetric crypto for this authentication purpose, but that one chance out of two, they took the good method. No. Okay. So with that, I can write really quickly a few, uh, within a few lines a Python script that does the stuff. 
of encrypting or decrypting uh, token. With that, I can take my paying account token, I decrypt it, I see what's in it, I can put whatever I want in it, I re-encrypt it, and then I will spoof the server, I send it to the server, and see what happens with that. So, convenient. Login flow. Uh, basically, what's done, uh, when you start the application for the first time, you have a login password screen where you are supposed to put the same login password on, on the website. With that, they take the login, the password, some device info, they add a signature. We will see later that it's not used, it's been implemented, but they don't check anything on it. So maybe for the specs, it's okay. They have implemented the signature on authentication, so that's good, but they are not checking it. Well. Then they take all this data, they encrypt it with the method, and then they send it to what they call a mobile gateway, and in answer to that, the mobile gateway returns a user ID and a session ID. It looks strange, because right now they just needed some kind of session cookie or whatever to do the job. But really this mobile gateway for me it's uh, like a hack on top of their existing uh, web server, and they did not know how to integrate the uh, native app with their uh, lo standard login page on the server. So they put something in the middle, and they try to convert your mobile authentication token to some kind of pseudo username and password that will be working with the web solution. So you give this token and then you get a user ID, session ID, you will store that on the mobile device, and then for the next time when you are going to retrieve the, the DRM stuff and the magazines, you, are, you will be computing a new authentication token, which will be the same encryption method, of course, but with this new user ID and session ID. And then it stays forever, so this is just an indirection on logins. It's really strange design. So now let's have a look at those user ID and session IDs. Uh, first, it looks like, yeah, just basic integers. So really, the entropy is bad, really, really bad. Session cookie should be like 20 byte length to make sense. Here, we just have four bytes. Uh, and then I say, oh, okay, maybe I'm lucky. Those two numbers, they were even numbers. I say, okay. I have one chance out of four, right? Let's do some tests and see if there is something behind that. So I can create 10 free accounts with my batch. They don't check the email validation address, so that's easy. So I send all that, and then I retrieve the results, and of course, all the numbers are even, and we see what user ID, it's a sequence number incremented by two. I think there's a bug in their identity management uh, stuff or whatever, so that they lose one account. Too. Well, for me, it's super cool because it's a sequence number, so it's highly predictable. So what does it mean? The first time people will log in, they will have this user ID created. So if I, if I want to go back in history, I just have to decrement it, and I will see uh, all their subscriptions with that. And then session ID. This one is amazing. Uh, if you have a look at it, you, in binary form, you just have, so it's only 32 bits, but the first 16, there are zero, 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 zero. <laughs> so now I'm sure OWASP M4, this is clearly gonna be insecure authentication. So now, things a bell to me, I say, okay, come on. Why are there those 16 zero bits uh, when you start with. So what I do, I say, hmm, we've seen that there was this Apache on Windows uh, with a stack trace, it was clearly PHP. Say, clearly, it's a bug from PHP or whatever. So you Google PHP Windows random, first line you find, yeah, there's a problem on Windows. You just get 15 bits of entropy for the random method. So it's going to be easily predictable. So, well, I do the job. PHP, it's cool, it's open source. So let's have a look at the method source code. I rewrite it in Python, it's less ugly like that. And I try, <laughs> and I try to do the job. So I take a brand new Windows 10 and the latest PHP version at that time. And then, yes, it works, exactly. I can predict 
exactly the numbers because it's only 15 bits. So it's really, if you have two uh, random numbers, you can find by the stack super easily, and then you can predict everything you want. Yeah. Well, in practice, it didn't work. I couldn't find any like sequence link between the session ID. So I could not predict all the users, uh, the session ID. So I was a bit disappointed. I thought it was going to be a bit easier. It didn't happen. I don't know what's going on on the server. So I guess the random is also used by, uh, by other services. And so that's why I can't see any link if I just focus on the mobile users. But yet for me, it's OK because just 15 bits, I can boot for that because I know the user IDs. So it's only like 30,000 possible session IDs. If they have hundreds of thousands of users, uh, I will find super easily uh, those session IDs. And for me, again, this white hat here, for me what's good is uh, with this user and session ID, I don't have any link to the original login password. So I won't be able to mess with user data because with this user ID and session ID, I cannot log on the web solution. So the only thing I can steal are the list of magazine of people, but people that I don't know. So I know I can continue. Uh, I, I won't discover some yeah, sensitive stuff like men subscribing to strange magazines or whatever. So first thing I do, uh, well, I will check if they log the accounts if you give fake session IDs, which seems basic. But when you see how everything has been implemented before, you can ask yourself, have they done something? Of course, no. They, didn't lo they don't log the account. So you can really just take one account and brute force it, and it's going to work. But, but even if they had decided to log the account, if you have many users, you can just fix the session IDs and then brute force all the user IDs. And at some point, you will find a matching couple for that. But they've done something else. So at one point, someone has thought that there is something that should be done, or maybe they had some security reviews that said, ah, if it's a wrong session ID, you have to make the people wait, like SSH. You give a wrong password, and then you have to wait. So what they decided to do is, yeah, wrong session ID, it takes eight seconds to receive the answer, and the answer being, this is a wrong session ID. But then, if you give a good session ID, it takes less than uh, 0.5 seconds. Uh, well, in practice, that was them. So for me, it's a really good oracle to find fast if it's a good session ID or not. I don't have to wait for the eight seconds because I know that <laughs> below one second, clearly, I should have an answer. So eight seconds after one, one second, I know it's not a good session ID. I can switch on. So this is just totally useless. <laughs> but they've done something. So maybe from a compliance point of view, they are <laughs> limiting the fake logins or whatever. So for a checkbox, it, it may be fine. Yeah, you guess I'm not really a fan of all those compliance stuff. But <laughs> OK, so now what I'm going to do? Uh, well, of course, I'm going to search for accounts with paying content. I discovered there are lots of free accounts, but uh, people just didn't buy anything. So, well, I can bridge for something that gives me access to nothing. Well, OK. So I'm looking for people with really paying content. And to do that, because it's subscription, I want to have like not too old subscriptions because if the people registered three years ago, there's a high chance that they didn't pay for the next subscription and that uh, I just get old magazines, which would be a shame. So I will do the brute forcing from the user ID backwards. So I, I start with my brand new user IDs from the automatic script and I go backward and I will find new subscriptions with that. I guess you won't see the details. For me, this slide is just for people interested. You download it and you have a look in detail. What's interesting, I'm using Python uh, with a request module. They have a really nice uh, API for timeouts. So it's super easy to say if nothing happens after one second, fail and, uh, and give this result. Uh, like with a just simple laptop, 
I can brute force it, but uh, I try to play like uh, 100 requests per second, but I, I realized I killed the backend. <laughs> <laughs> so this was clearly the limiting factor for me. It's not, I don't care about IDS or whatever. When you see it's uh, Apache 2011 and Win32 and whatever, I, I know they would be monitoring nothing. <laughs> Or at least if they catch me, it's something fun to ask, but okay. So what I can do, basically, I can, uh, I try to multi-thread as much as I can, but instead of 0 0.5 seconds, it gets like more two or three seconds, the response time. And then after that, I got my SQL stack trace in the answer. So, so it's cool. I didn't even try uh, an SQL injection, but for me, it was the next candidate if I couldn't succeed. So you get those nice MySQL stack trace which are really huge. So I have to fine tune my uh, boot frosting strategy to try to find as many results as possible, but still having their backend alive. Uh, so I can boot frost uh, like about uh, 20 session IDs per second. So on average, every 13 minutes, I get a correct account for that. So let it run one night, and then you get that. Wow. Cool magazine, oh, it's a French one. You can know how to build your own dress and cook your own stuff. There are other magazines that I won't show. <laughs> I won't like to give an incentive to <laughs> reuse this script as is. Uh, OK, so that's it. After a few hours, I have like dozens of uh, paying accounts, and I have all the magazines I want for free. Uh, so for me, it's okay. I won authentication bypass, so it was clearly insecure authentication. But it's not enough. Now, with my Android tablet, I can have a look at those magazine, but the quality is not so nice because it's, like it's rescale, and if you don't have a really big tablet, it doesn't look nice. So I say, okay, now I want to try to get out the PDF or whatever at the best resolution possible, well, and I want to bypass the DRM. Because when you see what they've done for the authentication, I think the DRM, <laughs> let's joke. <laughs> so what do they do? Well, we've reversed the application. So basically, I have all the source code. So I can see what they do in the DRM, how they check the DRM, if, the, if they have the right to display the magazine or not, and what they do for all this rescaling stuff. Uh, if you have a look at the sequence diagram, now they are using asymmetric crypto. Oh, bad for them, they do it the other way around. Here it's totally useless. What they do, they encrypt the document, the big document with a public key, which is fucking slow. And then in the next response, they give you the private key in this file. <laughs> uh, that's not finished. I told you, you would laugh. This one, you know, for me, uh, yeah, part of my job is doing code review. This is not funny all the time, especially when it's PHP. But sometimes you see, well, I'm a developer, so I can make jokes. Do you have like really creative people, but super creative people? And then, so we are talking about Java, and Java, they have done a decent job cryptography-wise with a GCE. And they have nice APIs, and then all for those uh, asymmetric crypto, uh, you really need secure random, so otherwise it doesn't mean anything. So they infer that you really give a class which is of the type secure random. Otherwise, you can't can't use the function. It just says, doesn't work, you get an exception. What we have here, I'll try the blue there, something called fixed secure random. <laughs> you know it's done in France, but Fix can mean two things. For me, first, I say, okay, they fixed it. So I have a look. <laughs> I, I Google it, and I see that, yeah, in practice, like in Android 2.3, there are, there are problems with the secure random. It was not that secure. It was not well sorted or whatever. So I say, oh, okay. So there's been one guy at one point, maybe he found something on Stack Overflow or whatever, <laughs> and he would make a better secure random. No. Fixed mean this is constant. <laughs> this is fixed. <laughs> so you have the constant secure random invented. <laughs> really, for me, it's a pity they never answered me because I would like to talk to this guy. <laughs> now, for me, yeah, 
for me, it's more like a test feature. The guy did not know crypto. He wanted to test the DRM, and he couldn't, of course, reproduce it. So he decided to have some constant in his secure random. So it's what OWASP called the extra news functionality, which is you let shit in the code in prod that should never have gotten there. That's it. OK. So now, uh, well, I have everything, so I can play with scripts. It takes more time now, because you have to play with the algorithm. You have to copy, paste this fixed secure random. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And then I decrypt the document, writing Java now. And I see its proprietary format. So here, you have like pictures. But you have also the text that would be uh, printed on top of the pictures. And then you have XML metadata for all this uh, index, page summaries, and whatever. So it's not usable as is. Uh, well, there is everything in the code to re regenerate the picture because the Android app is showing you the picture of the magazine. But if you want to do that by extracting the Java classes, it's really long because then you have class A that depends on class B and C and D and package and whatever. In the end, you, you take all the app. So, well, don't bother doing that. Uh, you will, we will see it's really easier to hook the application when, basically, when the application is going to display it. Well, ask for a screenshot or whatever. But we will see how to do it in iRes. So to do that, there is something that's really cool on Android if you want to do nasty things. It's called Exposed. It's uh, an interception framework. Uh, so what it does, you install it, and it runs in uh, the Java virtual machine. And you can basically do like JavaScript. Rewrite everything you want in it. So you can change the input of methods, the output, you can change the implementation. Uh, and with that, what's really convenient, you don't have to change anything in the original Android app. So you have the app running, the GVM, and you are changing the behavior on top of that. Uh, well, to be able to do so, of course, it doesn't work on a standard device. You need uh, to have rooted your device to be able to install that because you are really changing the way the operating system is running. Uh, so you have to root your phone uh, for me because I don't want losing time rooting my phone, finding the exploit or whatever, and maybe killing it. Uh, I use an emulator. There's one that's free for testing purpose. It's called Genymotion. They use it at LinkedIn or whatever. And it's super cool because they have a special ROM, and you just have a tick, and then you get root. And then they have uh, like uh, SSH by default activated and whatever. So to do dynamic analysis, this is really super convenient. Uh, and then what you have to do, you have to write some Java code. So it's what they call the hook. So it's a plugin for Expose Framework. And basically, you are writing another separate application that you will deploy via the Expose Framework. The only thing you're knowing is that because it's really uh, deep in the Java virtual machine, each time you have to redeploy your hook, you have to restart your device. So that's why an emulator is convenient, and especially a fast emulator. So with that, again, you won't see the details, I guess. But what's interesting, I would point it here. There is a method that's called load page that loads the pictures. And then that, that does all the job. So the only thing I have to do, I have to hook the method that's called load page and then uh, call an extra method. That's my implementation. And that's just saving on the uh, SD card the screenshot. And then what's good is uh, here, normally, you have the parameters for the screen displays. I will change the parameters to have like a super, super high resolution display that doesn't even exist on Android yet. So I get really, really good quality pictures. I save it, so either you run it on your device and you get all the screenshots on your SD card, or you have an emulator that's super convenient. You get everything on your hard disk on your laptop, and then that's finished. So basically, with uh, 10 lines of code, you can capture everything you want. Uh, it's just, even if you're used to Java coding, it's the first time you are writing hook. Uh, it's not that obvious, because you have to uh, yeah, use like dynamic programming, so uh, you you have to know a little about introspection and all that stuff because what happens is so uh, you have the original Android app, you have your hook app, 
And you don't want in your hook app to depend on like 200 classes on the uh, original Android app because otherwise it won't compile. So what you have to do is to say instead of just calling the method, you have to call the Java introspection stuff and say, I would like to call the method that's name blah, blah, blah. So as soon as you master that, it gets really super fast to write those hooks. And then with that, I also write a small hook that uh, automatically changes the user ID and session IDs, and then I can have my fake app that's running for, let's say, uh, one hour, and then I can download hundreds of magazines with that. Okay, so now, first recommendations would be, yeah, think before coding. I can tell it, I'm a developer. Just, just take 10 minutes sometimes. I say threat model, it's not an exercise that's going to take you three months. Just make a small brainstorm with your colleagues, discuss a little of what could go wrong. Uh, so this, is, this app is funny, it has no impact, but uh, now you think about mobile banking. You think about e-health internet of crappy things with a companion on the smartphone. You think about this terrorist attack application. What happens if I can spoof and I can send a fake alert? You see the impact here. So that's really the goal of threat modeling. What is your application used for? Uh, and what do you really need in it? And should you do it or not? Even if the business is asking for it, if it's stupid, at one point you should tell it there. Even if you are just like standard developer. Uh, big question there, I will see the same mistakes. Uh, people don't know there is authentication. If you should recognize the device or the end user or both. Uh, you know, it's even WhatsApp and all that stuff, they have this kind of problem because they use the phone number, so they authenticate the device, but at one point, they want you to be able to use the web version or whatever, and then they have hacks where they send you a SMS and then you have to type in on other stuff and whatever. So really, that should be addressed at the beginning of the project. Do you want to, have, do you want to know who is using your app or do you want to know which technical device is using it? This makes a big difference. The other really important question is uh, for the offline mode. All marketing is going to ask you, yeah, it should work everywhere, even if I'm 200 meters below the sea, I want it to work because I want to be able to sell stuff. It's not going to be possible. Uh, the offline mode uh, is clearly a nightmare from a security point of view, especially on Android. You saw that it's super easy to do reverse engineering. So if you are not connecting to the backend really often to do some cross-checks, it's going to be, to be really, really difficult to have something secure. So, Sometimes it's better to say, okay, I give up the offline mode. Now you have 3Gs are almost everywhere. And if there is no, well, I don't spend like two thirds of my budget trying to secure the offline mode. I just give up and I stick to something online that's good from a security point of view. There's also the question what's called intellectual property. Let's say you have a super cool algorithm for face recognition or whatever. If you just put it as is in the app, Anyone can take it, we use the Java library, use it somewhere else. So it's also something touchy. Then, other recommendations. Those two recommendations for me, they are actually the most important. Do a good job server side. <laughs> Even if you are talking about mobile. Your security is going there. For the past 20 years, we've learned to secure backends and to have web apps that somehow secure. So do your job well, do your authentication and, and access control as you should, and test it. You need test if you can. For me, you should. I'll test all those authentication and changing token stuff and all, all that things to be sure that you don't have uh, bad corner cases. Then, client side. The only thing you can do for Android, treat the source code that you put in it as public, like JavaScript in a, in a web app. Anyone can find what's going there. So basically, you can just do GUI stuff if you have to address security. Uh, you can play with obfuscation. ProGuard is free. It's like 10 seconds to configure. It will change the names of the method with A, B, C, and whatever. So you make security analysts lose time. 
maybe if there was ProGuard, I couldn't find the correct string and I would have given up. But it's really not bulletproof. Uh, in Android, you can also have low-level C code if you want. It's what they call the NDK for a native development kit. Uh, here, well, you just raise the bar for reverse engineers because you're going to have a binary ARM code to reverse, which is like less people are able to understand that or they don't have the free version of IDA to, to reverse it. Uh, but it's just also a question of time. Then regarding network, uh, of course, you need SSL. Uh, yeah, so what's really bad here? Uh, you saw that the login token was sent on HTTP. So if I have a fake hotspot in McDonald's or whatever, I get the authentication token, and because the first one, and because I know the key, I can decrypt the login password of the web app. And the login password of the web app, you have access to some credit card data, you have the address or whatever. So you can decide to change, and you can even change the name of the guy with that afterwards. So SSL is super important, but on mobile, if you don't have certificate pinning, for me, it's almost useless SSL. If you are not sure you are discussing to the correct server, you're doomed. For the attacks, it's really in the mobile world, it's more easy to have fake hotspots. If you want to try something fancy, uh, create a fake Wi-Fi network and call it an uh, Apple Store. And you will see that any iPhone by default will connect to it. So really for mobile, this SSL security is super important and the only good solution is certificate pinning where you only accept the certificate of the expected server and then that's it. And then last ones. Yeah, don't play with crypto, really. <laughs> uh, except, except if you are working on a cryptographic protocol and, and you know what you're doing. It's clearly not easy question. I don't know if you saw a presentation from Pascal Junot yesterday. There are so many tricks and whatever. You don't want to do that. Yet, if you have to do something for authentication, just consider hashing. Never use symmetric crypto because it means you can retrieve easily the original password, so never do that. Uh, and if you start to do crypto, you are really going to have a hard time uh, with key management. Doing crypto, you can find examples, bad examples on Stack Overflow, you can find better examples, but no, none of them deal with key management. We saw that there is a secret key hard coded. If you want to have a different key per device, if you want to be able to renew key, it's complex. It's many use cases. You need to sync the server with the mobile apps and whatever, so you need to have rolling keys and whatever, it's, it's really tough. And if you don't have the key renewal scheme from the real beginning, it won't work. So sometimes I clash with uh, agile teams and whatever, I say no. If you want to do crypto, you cannot say, I'll do the encryption and then I'll do the uh, key renewal stuff, uh, maybe in uh, three sprints, if I have time, if I have budget, if I'm not late, well, if ever. Then random numbers, yeah. Before this app, I always read because, yeah, you know, I develop security solution and there are pen testers and I had reviews and sometimes, you know, the report is not that huge. Uh, you need to put something in it. And so sometimes I add stuff about random number generators. I say, okay, come on. This is really, really, really highly unlikely and tiny detail. Well, in fact, no, you can have really, <laughs> Bad number, so it means that every PHP running on Windows, hopefully it's not that much, but has really bad random. So um, I think it's still like thousands of backends on the earth that have really predictable randoms. So something also you have to take care. And then DRM, if someone asks you to implement a DRM, just tell him it will be bad. <laughs> you know, even Apple gave up. They try, they have lots of money with iTunes, and they just realize that it's annoying people and it's going to get broken at one point. It's just the time to break it. There are nice presentations that explain how we are looking at memory access or whatever. So without even looking at the code that I obfuscated, they can find back the key within a few minutes. So it's not gonna work. You can do security just with local code on the mobile app. And then last one. Plan a security budget for updates, really. Uh, it's something, on a website, it's easy. 
you are used to having patch and it's, it's easy to deploy, you just put it in the backend and then as soon as someone connects with his browser, he has a new version. For mobile, it's different because you have this publication process that can take uh, up to three weeks for Apple. And sometimes you have your personal experience, your app that's doing crypto, it's working fine, it's been accepted by Apple, and then three months after, you need a new version because you want to find something and say, hey, no, you can't use this uh, crypto algorithm. This, this is strange. Uh, we don't accept it anymore. And you're just stuck. You cannot republish it. So uh, you have really to plan it and know and update regularly so that you have less like you that have this, have having this kind of problem. And of course, you have to patch your server. Uh, I don't give the name of the app, but if you run Metasploit on those hosts from five years ago, yeah. Just want to say something before the question. Uh, I'm working on a tool that static analysis tool that trying to automate some of the stuff you saw that looking for poor crypto, hard coded keys, whatever. Uh, it would be available on GitHub. It's clearly not clean now, so I don't want to publish it. I don't want to have thousands of guys insulting me. <laughs> But the idea is really for like four points of the OWASP mobile top 10, you give the APK file, you wait like for one minute, and it will give you a red, orange, or green status on what's done for SSL, what's done for crypto, whatever, so that you have an idea of the insecurity of your app. Uh, you could, for example, run it on Snapchat and have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any questions? No question. Well, if you want, come speak to me. Green should be easy to see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just uh, I've shown that to some students. I do a course on it, of course, but they didn't fix it. I also show them how to hack an American game where you can have for free unlimited coins, whereas you're supposed to pay for that. Same kind of techniques. Within one hour, you get free coins. It's kind of funny because. When you are redirecting to Google Play at the time to play, uh, instead of having your card number, it's displayed Visa fake. You click OK and you get everything you want for free. And uh, I wrote to those guys, they are making millions per year out of this game. Millions, clearly. Just people uh, stuck in their level and they want to pay uh, one franc to get extra life. They just don't answer. They just don't care. Which is clearly the majority of, uh, of apps. Just people don't care. It's been developed most of the time by third parties. They don't get paid very well for that. Then it gets stuck on the application stores and there are no updates with it. So if you want to have a look at applications that may look bad, just have a look at the publication date. And then just with that, you have a, a good indicator of the poor quality of the app.